Well, would you please turn back in your Bibles to page 929 and 930, this account of Jesus riding into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we're going to home in particularly on verses 39 and 40. There are sermon searches and there are prizes in this service for um, Elijah, <coughs> Isaiah, Noah, and Sahara, I think. Verse 39, page 930, Luke chapter 19. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Imagine that you're a really good football player and you're in a good football team and you're playing an important match and it isn't going well. You're missing the passes, you're tripping over the ball, your usual dazzling step-overs and scissors and whatever they call them, my grandchildren tell me. Um, they're not working. And it's so bad that your manager sends you off. Put someone else in, someone from the second team, not nearly such a good player as, as you are, and you have to sit on the bench, you have to watch. No one likes to be replaced, do they? Especially by someone with less skill. But what if you were replaced by a rock? You with feelings and arms and legs and skills and a brain and speech, replaced by a rock. That's what Jesus pictures here. Worshipping people replaced by stones. And if these people right now were not shouting out praise to God for Jesus, then the very stones that are strewn all around on the ground would be. If they didn't, Jesus says, then the rocks would. The Bible often talks about creation, God's creation praising him. It, it does, in a certain way. God's creation brings praise to him. In Psalm 146, for example, uh, we read these words. 148, actually. Verse 7, praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl. The psalmist is calling on creation to praise God. Isaiah 55 says that the mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Near where I lived as a, a child, there was a wood that was called the clappers. It stood on a hill and the trees were quite close to each other and in the wind you could hear the, the branches clapping against each other. And that's why it was called the clappers locally. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. Just this week we've seen astonishing pictures, haven't we, of that black hole. It was quite awesome, really. The lead scientist of the Harvard project said black holes are the most mysterious object in the universe. We've seen what we thought was unseeable. Is it a passageway into a new universe? They're speculating about it. Well, that black hole, that praises God as well. We look at it and we think that's awesome, but what about the God who created it? But this world of created things, created beings, animate and inanimate, is meant to be the supporting cast, the second team. Praise to God should come most forcibly, most consistently, most eloquently, most loudly from the people that God has made, from you and from me. 
We are God's first team. We are animate, alive. Stones and rocks are inanimate. Black holes are inanimate. We have voices, we have senses, five senses, bodies, brains, minds, souls, all given to us by God. We feel things, we experience things, we enjoy things. And of all God's creation, of the whole created universe, we are the ones who should be praising him the most. How are we doing? How are we doing today? How are you doing in the praise of God? Are you kind of reluctant or shy or silent? You have so much reason to praise your God, don't you? So much reason to praise your maker while you've breath. And your biggest reason is Jesus himself. Jesus who came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, determined to be our savior, determined to die for our sins, to make us right with God. Oh, praise him. In the Gospels, you know, when you read them carefully, you'll find something that we call the messianic secret. It's the idea that Jesus wanted to keep his identity rather quiet for a while. He didn't want people to get the wrong idea, you see, about him as king. The Jews of Palestine were living under Roman rule, and they resented it deeply. Their hope for the Messiah was mostly a political hope. They thought that he would come as a great earthly king, leading his people to freedom from Roman oppression. They visualized him on a war horse, not a donkey. And Jesus was careful, especially in his early ministry, not to encourage this view of him. Often, after he had taught a great crowd of people, he sent them away. He allowed the situation just to melt away. He didn't look for publicity. He didn't exploit a political opportunity. And, and, and actually, when you look at Mark's gospel especially, you can see that it was all about timing, because Mark is a gospel in two halves. And in the first half of his gospel, Jesus often tells people, no, not to talk about him, doesn't he? When he healed the leper, he gave him a strong warning. See, you don't tell this to anyone. Even when he brought Jairus' daughter back to life, he told the family to keep it quiet. And you might say, well, how can you do that? How can you keep something like that? Something as big as that? The resurrection from the dead. How can you keep that quiet? And when he healed a deaf, mute man, he commanded the people who, who saw it, who witnessed it, not to tell anyone. But Mark tells us the more he told them, the more people kept talking about it. They kept on about it. And there was a sense, you see, in which it was all so wonderful that if they kept quiet, well, then surely the very stones would cry out. The messianic secret is also clear in John's account of the feeding of the 5,000, when after it, the people wanted to take Jesus by force, it says, and make him king, their kind of king, their kind of Messiah. And what does John tell us that Jesus did? He just went off on his own into the mountain, as so often he did, to pray just by himself. But in Mark's gospel, there is a turning point. The turning point happened at a place called Caesarea Philippi. And at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus gathered his disciples round him, and he asked them, what are people saying about me? What do people think about me? Who do people say that I am? And they gave various answers, and then Jesus said, but what about you? What do you think? And Peter gave that great answer, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. And from that point on, things change. Things aren't a secret anymore. Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem. And now it's not the time for secret. It's a time for revelation. It's a time for disclosure. So we thought about the messianic secret, and now we think about the messianic revelation. 
And we see Jesus at this point riding into Jerusalem, surrounded by crowds, vast multitudes of people. Uh, some of them are throwing down their coats. Some of them have got palm branches that they've ripped off the trees, and they're shouting loudly. They're shouting out their praise to him. He's not on a war horse. He's on a donkey. But he's every inch a king, isn't he? He's the king. And he's deliberately fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. It's wonderful, isn't it, to see Old Testament prophecy fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus deliberately fulfilling it. Listen to these words from the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Why should he be praised like this? Why should we shout? What have we got to shout about? Well, he's the king of creation, isn't he? All the Gospels tell us that the, the donkey that Jesus rode had never been ridden before. It was a colt. It was a young donkey. Now, animals like that don't normally just let you get on them, do they? Uh, they have to be broken in. And on that first ride, especially, you have to be very careful not to spook the animal. So you take it on a nice, gentle ride around the field, don't you? No one else around. That's what you do the first time round. Even when a horse is experienced and the rider is experienced, you have to be careful. If you pass one or two or a crowd of them on the road in your car, you have to slow right down. You do do that, don't you? Country code and all that. You have to go by them very, very slowly so that you don't spook the horse. But when this young animal experienced its very first rider, it's like putting it on the hard shoulder of the M6. It's just surrounded by noise and hubbub and confusion and commotion and people shouting and yelling and things thrown at it, things being thrown at its feet, coats, tree branches, all sorts of stuff is going around this animal. And yet it behaves as calm as you like. And why is that? Because it has the king on its back. The king of creation. The one who calmed the sea, calmed the elements. The one who walked on water. The one who healed raving mad people and cast the evil out of them. It's him. And John says the world was made by him, and he was in the world. And here he is, the Lord of creation, and he's in his creation, and he's on his creation. And if the disciples don't praise him, then the very stones are going to cry out and declare who he is. He's the king of creation. Then we see he's the king of his people. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Your king is coming. He's coming to you. He's coming to his people. He's coming for his people. And as the Bible unfolds, it becomes clear he's coming not only for the Jews, but he's coming for the whole world. He's the savior of the world for all the people who will come to believe in him. And when we realize that this is who Jesus is, that he is Emmanuel, that he is God actually with us and for us. God come to us to be our saviour. Well, if his disciples don't shout out his praise, who's going to? And then we see how he's the king of salvation. Salvation. What a word. How much you need it, you and I, the work that he's come to do, you see, is so much bigger than any, any politics or any movement of 
emancipation or deliverance in political terms. Jesus has come to save. He's come to be baptized with a baptism of terrible suffering. He's going to be taken in a few short hours by wicked hands, and he's going to be killed, he's going to be crucified. Because he has come to take our sins upon himself, to carry them away, right away. <coughs> Only he can do this. To bear the wrath of God against it, to shed his blood as an atoning sacrifice, to finish once and for all the great work of salvation that you and I could not do for ourselves, to die on the cross and to be raised on the third day. And he has come to conquer the power of sin and even death. Think of that. He's come to conquer the power of death. Draw the sting out of it. He's come to deal with hell. He does the greatest thing. He is the greatest king. And he does it in the middle of the world stage. There's no messianic secret about the cross, you know right there in the center of human history for us all to gaze at, for the whole world to know about it. Because he does it for the world. He's our savior. The prophet Zechariah says he has salvation. I like that. He has it. He's endowed with salvation. So if you don't cry out in praise and adoration then surely the inanimate stones will instead of you. Then he's the king of love. You see Jesus' willingness to go to such a place of sacrifice and you see his love. You see his gentleness, his meekness, and you see his love. You follow him in every step of his terrible journey in Gethsemane, when his sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground, his arrest, his trial, the injustice of it, the whipping, the scourging, the mocking, the crown of thorns, and you see him nailed to the cross, and you hear his words on the cross, his words of love, words of salvation, and you just know that this is the king of love. It's love that takes him there, nothing else. And you go to him, don't you, for your forgiveness. You go to him to deal with your sin and your uncleanness. You go to wash in that fountain that is open for sin and uncleanness and to be clean because of him. But don't rush away from there, will you? Don't treat it lightly. Don't go to the cross and say, well, I'm all right now. How could you do that when you see what it cost him? How much it meant for him to go to that place. It's at that very place that you will learn to see sin for what it is. You will learn to hate sin and to flee from it and to deal with your strongest temptations and your most besetting sins. The dying love of Jesus has the power to change you and to give you victory and to strengthen you in your fight with sin like nothing else will or can. When you see the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane for you and on the cross of Calvary for you, then your heart will be changed. Your heart will be captivated by this astonishing love and you will begin to learn to do what the disciples failed to do in the garden, that is, watch and pray. At the cross, when you see, you'll begin to learn to watch and pray. As Jesus said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. He's the king of love. If you don't praise him, who's going to? He's the, the king of character. The prophecy in Zechariah particularly emphasizes his character, doesn't it? Look at your king. He's coming to you. What's he like? He's just. He's righteous. 
He's lowly. He isn't selfish. It's not all about him. It's not about political power. It's not about his reputation. He's not out to exploit. He doesn't say one thing and do another. Here is a perfectly righteous man, a totally just king. Are you disillusioned with the world's leaders and politicians? Many people are disillusioned even with our own. You'll never be disillusioned with Jesus Christ. You'll never be disappointed with him. The world has never seen his like before and never will again. A perfectly just man, a human being who is totally righteous. As he rides into Jerusalem, you can see genuine, the genuine article, you can see spiritual majesty. And this particular Palm Sunday, all these years later, praise God for him. Worship God for his wonderful character. And if you don't, you're going to re be replaced by someone else or something else that will. He's the king of character. He's the king of glory. You catch a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. His whole story reveals his glory. When John tells the story in his gospel, he says, we saw his glory. We saw who he was through what he did and what he said. And there are moments when that glory in Jesus, it just sparkles and dazzles. It did on the Mount of Transfiguration for the three disciples, Peter and James and John, when the veil was drawn aside and they saw Jesus in his, in his transcendent splendor. But his glory is also revealed, you know, when his divinity is more hidden. His glory is seen in his humility uh, and in his grief and in his sacrifice of himself, in his sufferings, in his willingness to be our Savior. Do you see glory in this? His glory is seen in his weakness as well as in his power. Oh, praise him for who he is. Let's just draw this together with just uh, three lessons. The first is a lesson about faith. Luke tells us that it was the disciples of Jesus who were praising him so loudly. Verse 37, if you look at that, it refers to a, to a whole crowd of disciples, doesn't it? The whole multitude of disciples. The Pharisees call out of this crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them off. Put a stop to it. But it's at this very point that Jesus says, I tell you, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. The whole of creation is waiting with bated breath. But the response, the key response, is faith. And where do you find faith? Well, it's in human beings, in people like you and me. The best praise to Jesus comes from real faith in Jesus. He is honored by faith in him. It comes from disciples. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ today? Not ashamed of him. Not ashamed to confess him and to say he is your savior. John in his gospel tells us that all that he records is so that we who read the gospel will believe that he is the son of God, the Christ, and believing we will have life in his name. Shall angels sing the honor of his name and sinners saved by grace silent remain? Shall the whole world of creation clap its hands? And the very people who are the targets and the recipients of this great salvation remain unmoved? Unresponsive? Unbelieving? May the Holy Spirit work among us today so that we say from humble hearts, Lord, I believe. I believe. 
Please help my unbelief, because it's there, isn't it, in all of us. Please help my unbelief. And out of that conviction as to who Jesus is and how much you need him, and out of a full heart today to shout out, Hosanna, hallelujah, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Glory in the highest. True praise comes from believing hearts. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ today, then let me tell you, you're out of tune with the whole of God's creation. You're out of sync with the universe. Creation knows, the whole of creation knows that its restoration and its redemption lies in Jesus Christ. And the only honorable thing for you today, to do today, is to believe in him, to commit yourself to him, and to come to him just as you are, which he invites you to do. That's the first lesson, then, a lesson about faith. The second lesson is a lesson about testimony, witness. The call of Jesus to us is that we shouldn't be ashamed of him. He often said so, didn't he? He said to his disciples, I don't want you to be ashamed of me. If you're ashamed of me, then when I come, I am going to be ashamed of you. He wants us to vocalize our faith. He wants us to publicize our faith. He spoke often about us denying ourselves in order to do this, taking up our cross, following him. If you love me, he says, if you really do, then keep my commandments. And his commandment is very clearly that we should come out of our hiding places. Follow me, he says. This is his authoritative call to us, that we should follow him. And he has given us one particular way in which we can do that, that is believer's baptism. It's a clear way of publicly making it known that we are following Jesus, that we are his disciples. If you are a believer in him and you haven't done this, then you should do this. Whatever the problems and obstacles are, you should do this. Then will I tell, tell your story. Then will I tell to sinners round, what a dear saviour I have found. I'll point to his redeeming blood. That's where you point when you give your testimony, you see. Not to yourself, not to your experience. I'll point to him. I'll point to his redeeming blood and say, look, behold, the way to God. This is the way for you to go. Come and hear all you that fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. When the Holy Spirit works in us, convicting us of our sin, showing to us something of the beauty of Jesus, then there will be this compulsion. You won't be able to help it. You won't be able to hold back. The love of Christ constrains us. The grace of God is irresistible to us. If I don't speak about my Savior, if I don't testify to him, then surely the stones are going to cry out if I don't do it. Do you want to be shamed by stones? Do you really? You'll want to tell others, won't you? You'll want to witness at work with your work colleagues, with your friends, your neighbors. You'll overcome the barriers, won't you, if you can to tell them about Jesus, because you're not ashamed of him. How could you be ashamed of the Son of God, of the Savior? A lesson about witness and testimony. And then finally, a lesson about worship. I wonder how important it is, it is to you to worship, to praise God, to bring praise to Jesus. Is that why you've come here today, essentially? To bring praise to God, consciously to bring praise to God for Jesus Christ. I wonder whether your attitude to public worship reflects this, reflects your love for Jesus Christ. Or are you kind of casual about public worship? I know there's personal worship, but I know you can worship God at home 
But this is a gathering of believers here on Palm Sunday, isn't it? It's a crowd of disciples. They're together. They're praising God together. They're praising God out of the crowd. What's your attitude towards when God's people meet together and gather together like this? Do you want to be among them? Do you want to join your voice? Do you want to sing out the praises of Jesus as loud as you can, as enthusiastically as you can, as best you can? Is that your aim? Is that your endeavor? Or are you kind of half-hearted? Do you pick and choose your preachers as if it was a preacher that mattered? Or do you come together because you want to praise God? You want to bring praise to God for the Lord Jesus? Do you stay away from public worship at the slightest excuse? Do you look for reasons not to be here rather than reasons to be here? Or do you come in the spirit of so many of the Psalms, I will pay my vows now in the presence of his people. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Do you join in the singing of the praises of God enthusiastically, whether you like the tune or not? Whether you like the song or not? Because he is just worthy of your praise. Shouldn't there be a sense every day, and especially on the Lord's day, if I don't bring praise to God, then surely the stones are going to cry out, and I don't want to be shamed by stones. Do you? I don't want to be replaced by a rock. Amen.